afternoon. Welcome to City Club's Friday Forum with our State of the City 2004. Looking forward, the challenges and opportunities ahead with Portland Mayor Vera Katz. I would like to acknowledge, too, uh, David Broder, who has come. He's a, well, listen to that. People are saying, oh! He has come, uh, he's a renowned international reporter and he works for the Washington Post. He's been a friend of Mayor Katz's for over 32 years and he's here today just in her honor. So, <laughs> so we have major star power. Uh, if you would all be good enough to turn off your cell phones and other noise-making devices before we begin, I'd be most appreciative, as would all of us. Uh, just a few announcements before we begin. N next Friday, December 17th, our forum will feature Dr. Molly Coy, and she'll be speaking on a subject with a provocative title, Dr. Welby and the Green Eye Shade Boys, Can Technology Rescue Healthcare? I think you have to go back a ways to know Dr. Welby, but as I look around the room, I think there are a few of us. <laughs> that will be held here at the Governor at uh, 1215. And I want to mention, too, that for several weeks we've been having an art raffle to help us raise funds to uh, equip our new City Club Commons room. And our lucky winner is Lorraine Thomas. I hear a gasp. Oh, well, all right, Tamsin. She's a friend of Tamsin's, in case you hadn't noticed. And so she'll be Tamsin Wassell. She'll be uh, able to have her choice of one of the five beautiful art pieces that were donated by local artists. Thanks so much. Our next book club, Citizens Read, will be held January 31st at our City Club's Common. And the book is Bobos in Paradise by another well-known reporter, David Brooks. Bobos is a term he's coined for the bourgeoisie and bohemians. It will be at our newly named City Club of Portland stop. Thanks to a co-sponsorship with the Portland Streetcar, the 9th in Washington and Stark Streetcar stop will now be entitled the City Club stop. Is that great? <laughs> so join us there. Uh, you do need RSVP for that. Those fill up. Uh, details on all of the events that I mention here are on our website at pdxcityclub.org. You can also get involved with our citizens blog. Now week after week, I mention the benefits of membership in City Club. For example, our new look and our new location that's over here on 9th and Washington in the Piddock building, it's walk in and browse our library or interact with other interested citizens in City Club Commons, which is our new meeting space or bring your wireless commu computer to O'Brien Square and use the wireless hookup that we're providing. City Club's most public face has always been these Friday forums, and we have our annual programs such as our State of series that features State of the City, State of the State, State of the Schools, and State of other major forces that help shape uh, the region. You can also come and hear Pulitzer Prize winning journalists and authors, speakers with international reputations, and of course our well-known local speakers who keep us informed. And since members only have the privilege of getting up close and personal with our speakers because of our question and answer period, the City Club is also well known for its in-depth unbiased research reports which continue to inform and influence public policy. Recent reports have included uh, affordable housing, our community policing study, which Chief Foxworth commended last week in his address. And upcoming studies are to be released early next year on the Portland Development Commission and on school funding. In addition, citizens continue to report that our ballot measure studies are very helpful. Add to that our Citizens Read Book Club, citizen salons where interested and interesting people get together to philosophize on matters of civic importance, our after-hours programs such as New Leaders and the Slow Food Series with others in the works. In fact, I think we need to give a free membership to Willamette Week because they call us stodgy and painfully predictable. <laughs> hey, it's not your father's city club anymore, Willamette Week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I would like to commend Willamette Week, however, for one really good thing. They recognized our executive director, Wendy Wad Rodmacher Willis, as one of the 50 most influential women in Portland on their up and coming list. <laughs> Woohoo! Well deserved, Wendy. However, if you never attend a Friday forum, if you never read a research report or ballot measure study, if you never attend even one of City Club's many events, as a City Club member, you can still be proud to call yourself a concerned citizen because your membership dollars go to support our continued efforts to be true to our perhaps stodgy, but more relevant than ever mission statement, which is to inform its members and the community in public matters and to arouse in them the realizations of the obligations of citizenship. City Club provides a much needed forum for civil discourse on civic matters and I invite you to join today. There are membership bulletins or membership applications on the table or you can also go to www.pdxcityclub.org. And for those of you, our blue light special today only, we will skip the $25 setup fee if you join today. So please do join us in our efforts to help all of us engage in more civil civic engagement. And friends and associates who couldn't get tickets to today's program that will be rebroadcast tonight at 7 p.m. this evening on OPB radio and 8 p.m. on channel 30. Audio CDs of today's program are also available. And broadcasts, broadcasts this quarter are also made possible in part by our community service-minded sponsors. This quarter they're Nike, Portland General Electric, and Preston Gates and Ellis LLP. Now, on to our very special program today. As Mayor Vera Katz presents the state of the city to the City Club for the 12th and final time. Her speech today, characteristically for her, is entitled Looking Forward, the challenges and opportunities ahead. But I would be very remiss on this special occasion if I didn't take this opportunity to, re opportunity to review some of her very special accomplishments. When Mayor Cass was elected mayor in 1992, she was already one of Oregon's best known political figures. She began her political career in the late 1960s working on Robert F. Kennedy's political or presidential campaign and she was elected the Oregon House of Representatives in 1972. She became one of the state's trailblazers when chosen in 1985 as the first woman speaker of the Oregon House. And I would like to say that's quite an accomplishment, even though Oregon has a reputation partly based on this election of being a progressive state, that was quite an accomplishment for a woman and for a woman with a New York accent to, to go as far as she did in the state legislature. I see other women trailblazers in the room. There's Gretchen Kafori and Pauline Anderson, but uh, it just attests to Oregon's progressive nature that we were able to get such wonderful leadership from these women. She remains the only person to have served as speaker for three consecutive terms. And she was an enormously productive legislator with her greatest accomplishment probably being her sponsorship of the Oregon Education Act for the 21st century. But she's also known for the state's groundbreaking gun control legislation and legislation prohibiting discrimination based on gender in places of public accommodation and on credit. We had no doubts on January 1st, 1993, that we were getting a mayor who would bring energy and vision to this city, and we were not disappointed. It's difficult to walk a city block today without seeing the handiwork of Vera Katz. These photographs hanging behind me are partial testament to how her many achievements have changed Portland's skyline. They were kindly donated by Phillips Guzzi of Precision Images. They've changed Portland's skyline and how many of us live and go about our lives differently because of Vera Katz. If you traveled here today via the Portland streetcar or on Max, then you got here courtesy of Mayor Katz's vision of a varied and accessible public transit system. Ray Polani probably helped with that. <laughs> if later you walk along the East Bank, East Bank Esplanade, and I have it from Sam Adams, this is the announcement, it is soon to be named the Vera Katz East Bank Esplanade. <laughs> or
or if you walk along the expanded Tomacall Waterfront Park or enjoy a brief respite in the Chinese classical gardens, you can thank Meerkat's vision of creating refreshing public spaces in our city. Her commitment to community policing and public safety has resulted in a drop in the crime rate to a 30-year low. Her leadership as mayor has brought national attention to Portland, which has been named the most livable city in America by Money Magazine, the best place to live by CNN, number one cycling city in North America by Bicycling Magazine, and among the top 25 arts destinations by American Style Magazine, and according to the Portland Business Journal, it was named as the leading in the nation in women-owned businesses. In 2001, Portland was named the nation's most child-friendly city as well. She's continued to champion schools, even though schools are not traditionally under the city government's purview. And her semi-retirement, and I say semi-retirement, because she's vowed to go before the city council whenever she feels they need some correction. <laughs> Surprise! <coughs> is going to take some getting used to. She has been a force of nature in Portland, and we're going to miss her. But right now, we're anxious to hear her message for us and for our city today. Mayor Katz. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was trying to do this elegantly, sit on this stool. Uh, the last time I had to do that was at Regis and Kelly when a delegation went to New York after 9-11. And I, it wasn't what I was going to say. It was my fear that I couldn't get my butt up on the stool <laughs> elegantly. It's been a little easier uh, this afternoon. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. This is a bittersweet occasion for me. My 12th and last State of the City Address. It won't be about the past, though there'll be a little bit about the past, but it will look ahead to the challenges and the opportunities of the future. In my last year in office, the question of legacy has come over and over Again, don't ask me that question. I will not answer it. My response has been the quip made by former Chinese Premier Cho Enlai. He was asked what he thought had been the impact of the French Revolution 200 years ago, and his reply was, it's too early to tell. <laughs> well, if that's true for the French Revolution, then it's clearly too soon to define my legacy. Time and history will do that. I don't have to. I know what I've tried to do. I also know that nothing was done alone, but always hand in hand with you, the citizens of this community, with my colleagues on the city council, with my colleagues in other local jurisdictions who shared my passion for this city. At its heart, my goal was your goal, to ensure that Portland is counted among the great cities of the world. We work to make Portland a global and international city, comfortable with diverse cultures and competitive in a world economy. We strengthen our many distinctive neighborhoods and are creating new ones in the Pearl and the River Districts and now in the South Waterfront. We put considerable energy into reconnecting Portland to its crown jewel, the Willamette River, and we did that through the River Renaissance Initiative, led by my planning bureau. We created many new wonderful public spaces, the East Bank Esplanade, the Chinese Classical Garden, and don't forget Jameson Square. And we achieved these things through a commitment to good planning and urban design. Now, our work has been about place, but it's also been about people. Together as a community, we stood up for Portland's values of respect for all of our citizens and in defense of every person's civil liberties. And I thank you all for that. The work of transforming our city has not been easy. 
And my message to you today is that there's still much hard work ahead. There are challenges, but there are also opportunities. And they are frequently intertwined. In fact, within the challenge, we often find the opportunity. There is, for example, the challenge of managing our growth because Portland and this region are going to continue to grow and grow rapidly. Either real estate becomes, we have a couple of choices. We're going to see about a million more people coming in the next 25 years. It'll create enormous pressures, pressures on us. People need to have a place to live. And unless we continue looking for innovative housing policies and funding for it, we're going to have two choices. Either real estate becomes so expensive that ordinary citizens, especially families, will have trouble finding housing and Portland will become a ghetto for the well-to-do, or we allow sprawl on such a scale that traffic congestion will become a nightmare and our quality of life will greatly deteriorate. And this year, the voters added to this challenge by passing ballot measure 37. Of course, no funding was attached to cover the cost of our potential claims. What's so disturbing to me, and I know to many of you, is that Oregon and Portland are national leaders in thoughtful land use planning, smart growth, and high quality urban design. And if we don't do anything to protect that legacy, it may be too late. So today I call up. So today, I call upon the governor and our state legislature to immediately address the ambiguities and shortcomings of the measure. They must provide a way to deal with legitimate cases of unfairness without undoing the protections that have shaped the Oregon's landscape. I hope that a reasonable course of action will be found and found soon. But But that course of action must be true to the vision for Oregon, first articulated by Governor Tom McCall and placed into law by Senate Bill 100. That vision, which has made this state and this city a model for the nation and the world, must be preserved. If not, Oregon will no longer be the very special place. Now, pundits tell us that in elections, voters sent messages. I hope the message they send us by passing 37 is not that in the words of the poet Ogden Nash, and I quote, progress might have been all right once, but it's gone on too long, unquote. <laughs> For while we've accomplished a great deal of these things in the past 12 years, much is left undone. We shouldn't underestimate the degree to which our city has transformed over the past 12 years. Some of that is evident by simply walking around the city and seeing how dramatically its face has changed. As I look up and see the many construction cranes currently outlined in the city skyline, I shake my head that there are still people who criti criticize Portland as a bad place to do business. As I As I listen to this criticism, I recall that it was just eight short years ago that Portland was heralded by Forbes mag magazine as having one of the hottest economy and jobs market in the nation. The conditions that led to that ranking have not changed. If anything, we've improved our business climate by streamlining our permitting process and eliminating onerous regulations. But what has changed is that our economy is very different from the economy that existed just two decades ago. The industries rooted in our pioneer heritage are being supplanted by new types of pioneers. Many of these pioneers are those educated young adults that some call the creative class, but I lovingly refer to them as the young and the restless. They've drawn here in great numbers by our city's beauty, just ask them why they're here, by our culture, 
by affordability, and by a reputation for innovation. Being young, they know that the greatest constant in the world today is change. They're comfortable with it. They find opportunity in change, and so should we. Our challenge is to keep them here and provide them opportunities to flourish and prosper. That's why I'm recommending that the new economic development fund that I created and which was approved by the council in this year's budget be used primarily to focus on stimulating what we call here the creative economy. The creative economy is admittedly difficult to define or quantify. It doesn't have their own C SIC number. It crosses many different types of industries and professions. But you can see and feel its impact in the many new businesses that are sprouting up in our city. Our leadership in the creative economy is one reason why Port Portland is currently ranked by one economic index as having the most diverse economy in the nation today. This diversity bodes very well for our economic future. The bottom line, and as a mayor, I will continue saying it, this is a great time to be in Portland and to invest in Portland. The, the signs of this positive economic future are already being seen. The last year has brought us a series of good economic news. Freightliner added a second shift. Quest is expanding its service center. Oregon Steel is moving a newly acquired California company here. Grand Heritage Hotels, where we're sitting right now, established their corporate headquarters in our city. Banfield, the pet hospital, the nation's largest system of private veterinary hospitals, is building its new corporate headquarters in Portland. And firms like Integra and Thorex have relocated here, secure in the knowledge that the city of Portland is a great place to do business. We're also awaiting an announcement from Silktronic as to whether Portland will edge out Singapore as home to the new 300 millimeter wafer manufacturing plant and an estimated 500 family wage jobs. We are now a global city competing against the world. How well we compete will be determined by many things, but none as important as the quality of our schools. The results of a study released just this week and reported by the Oregonian showed that U.S. students now test below the average of students in other industrialized nations in overall math literacy. It's not that our schools are getting worse. In fact, our students' scores have held steady for the past three years. Rather, the students of other nations are raising theirs. Senior executive at IBM recently noted that if we don't ramp up our education system, the United States will, within a generation, lose the competitive advantage we now enjoy. The executive cited a study by Goldman Sachs, which states that China will overtake the United States as the world's greatest economic power by mid-century unless we take action today. What is even more foreboding is that IBM just recently announced that they're selling their entire computer and software business to China. We have had enough summits. We have wrung our hands in despair long enough. We must now actually do something. It is shameful, and there is no other word, that the Oregon legislature and the citizens of Oregon, with the exception of Portland and Multnomah County, have failed to adequately fund our schools.
shameful that we also failed to complete the implementation of reforms that passed into law 13 years ago in the Oregon Education Act for the 21st century. Now we are well into the 21st century, but instead of realizing the fruits of that vision, we're still agonizing over whether our schools will have enough money to provide the basics of a full school year. I confess that I'm baffled and I confess that I'm angry that this situation is not causing more outrage in our business community. They, more than anyone, should understand the economic and social costs of an inadequate education because it affects their bottom line. I look forward to the day when our business leaders walk into the office of the mayor, the governor, or their legislators and demand better schools, well-funded schools, with the same passion they pound the table for tax cuts. Reasonable taxes and regulations are vitally important to a healthy business climate. No one will deny that. But as important as they may be, there are other factors equally important. I've already mentioned good public schools, and I would add to that a strong, high quality, and accessible public university like Portland State University. But this is also about creating a place where educated, motivated, and talented people want to live because it is they that make companies and cities successful. Portland is a successful city because it is tolerant. It respects diversity. It has love for the arts because it's quirky. And when faced with a crisis, it delivers a solution. In fact, as a writer I admired named Jesse Katz once wrote in Los Angeles Magazine, and I quote, Portland is less a destination than a philosophy, unquote. <laughs> Part of that philosophy is to appeal to what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. Those angels have names like hope, optimism, and possibility. Here we haven't been and should never be afraid of big ideas, of thinking out loud, or of robust debate. This is essential to the spirit of Portland. I hope that I've lived up to part of that spirit. Not all of my big ideas have become a reality yet. <laughs> Some of them got labeled real quirky and even crazy. When I proposed covering a portion of Interstate 405 or rerouting a portion, oh, you can clap now. Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> or rerouting a portion of I-5 away from the east bank of the Willamette, or having the city purchase our major electric utility, or develop now I want to hear the applause too, or developing a plan to build a major league baseball stadium. I was trying to get us to think about the future and the possibilities of the future. Now I don't consider these things unfinished business, as I recognized, and many of you as well recognized, that these things would not be completed in my tenure uh, or in maybe even Tom's tenure. Rather, as I noted, I was trying to help set the table for future community discussions about what we want our city to be. There are, however, a few things that I have on my to-do list. You expected that, didn't you? Yeah. That I hope our next mayor, with your encouragement and assistance, 
will complete, or at least will begin to complete. I was deeply humbled to have the East Bank Esplanade named in my honor. Now I hope that the funding will be provided to complete the Esplanade as it was originally envisioned. I hope that a design and a feasibility study can be completed soon so we can revitalize Old Town Chinatown through the creation of a great Portland public market. <laughs> the freeway loop. Remember when I spoke about the freeway loop here a couple of years ago? You thought I was crazy then. It's been studied and studied and studied enough already. Now's the time for action. The Freeway Loop Advisory Group, headed by Noha Tulan, they concluded that the one and a half mile segment of the freeway that runs along the central east side between the Markham Bridge and I 5, I 84 interchange must be relocated and rebuild. We must reconnect this important neighborhood with the river and realize the untapped potential of valuable riverfront property. While it may take 25 or 50 years to realize this bold vision, the time to start is now. Soon, I hope we can announce that the renovation of the Meyer and Frank building is on track and that the May Company will make this store the magical place it once was. The future of PGE is critically important to the city of Portland and the economic health of this entire region. The current application at the Public Utility Commission for Texas Pacific Group faces significant opposition because it doesn't adequately benefit the ratepayers of this region. I'm convinced that ownership by the city with professional operations and oversight by a regional board of directors is a better solution for everyone. Should the PUC deny the application or TPG refuse to comply with the stringent requirements that may be requested by them, the city is poised to take immediate steps to reconnect with Enron and or its creditors to facilitate the acquisition of PGE. I also thought in recent weeks that perhaps I might again tackle the issue of the city charter reform <laughs> that would empower the mayor with greater authority and greater accountability. <laughs> However, after discussions with Mayor-elect Potter, he was interested in doing this himself. <laughs> and I agreed to leave this very important item for him to pursue through the creation of a Charter Reform Commission when he's ready to do that. Now, there's much more on our to-do list, such as maintaining our renewed commitment to community policing, completing the South Waterfront Greenway that is probably one of the most exciting projects that this community will ever see, extending the streetcar to the east side, finish the light rail system, just to name a few. But it's now Tom Potter's turn to tackle these and other critical issues. He comes into office as I did, brimming with new ideas and enthusiasm. He will also, as I did, confront problems that he didn't foresee, a grab at opportunities he hasn't yet envisioned. For the work of transforming a city in big ways and small ways is never done. It is a living, breathing organism constantly growing, changing, maturing. But no city, no organization can rest on past laurels. We must always look to the future. In fact, a legacy 
if it is anything, it's not about what you have done, but whether you have made it possible for others to do more. But Tom can't do it alone any more than I could. Leadership involves nurturing a host of citizens throughout the city and then harnessing their ideas and their energy for a common good. Portland has a grand tradition of civic involvement. The City Club is one institution that embodies that tradition. So I challenge you, as I've challenged you every year, to be leaders for the community. I challenge you to bring your own vision to the table with the fire and the passion to make the vision become reality of our future. Leadership is not that easy. It's about creating and focusing on a vision, creating a sense of urgency, about having high expectations, taking risks, protecting risk takers, and be willing to change direction when things are not working, and perhaps most importantly, to have a thick skin and a sense of humor. I've also learned from Yogi Berra over the years. I've absorbed a great deal of wisdom from the philosopher and the baseball catcher. In approaching my final year in office, I never forgot that it ain't over till it's over. In developing my final city budget, I was again reminded a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. <laughs> As I read the many media profiles of my time in office, I find it's true that I didn't say all those things I said. <laughs> and in looking ahead, I know it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> and finally, I recall this pearl. You've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. <laughs> well, I confess that I don't know exactly where I'm going or what I'll do next or when I'll get there. Although I'm very pleased to announce today that I've agreed to be affiliated with Portland State University's College of Urban and Public Affairs. And it's a role that's being developed as we speak. For 32 years, public service has been my life. I know I will miss elective office, but I also know that there are many ways and places to serve. Change could be a very good thing for people and for cities. A great city is not static. It's always being reborn. Rebirth is something we in Portland are more comfortable with than most. We do, after all, live in the shadow of volcanoes, and maybe that's why change frightens us a little less here than in most places. And maybe it's why we adapt to the unexpected. In my regard, my final year in office hasn't gone as expected or planned on a personal level. The cancer I've been battling these past months have taken more time and energy than I would have liked to spare. Still the joy of this job and the thrill of serving this city and my fellow citizens have been a great tonic for me. I've been deeply, deeply touched by the many expressions of good wishes and goodwill that I've received. Cards, letters, email, gifts, especially those sweet little hats made by little ladies from Newburgh, Oregon. They'll always be with me. You have all truly touched my heart, and I thank you for it. To my successor, who's sitting right in front, I offer my sincere wish that you can find this work as compelling and fulfilling as I have. I hope that you, Tom, enjoy what I have enjoyed, a loyal and passionate staff, collegiality, uncertain days with your fellow commissioners, 
the dedication and professionalism of our city employees, innovative and supportive partners from every segment of our city, and affection and support from our citizens. I've lived an interesting life, but I can tell you truly that serving as Portland's mayor, as your mayor, has been one of the greatest experiences of my lifetime. I cannot begin to thank you for this extraordinary honor. If you do remember me in times hence, this is the sentiment that I would like to be remembered by. This was a quote that was given to me while I was in ICU during my early cancer treatments. They're words from George Bernard Shaw. And I quote, my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatsoever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is sort of a splendid torch which I have got hold of for the moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. I hope I have lived up to such grand words. I thank you all, God bless you, and good afternoon. She asked me earlier who all these people were in the room, and I said, they're people who care about you. And we could have filled the upstairs room too. So um, it's now time for the privilege of asking questions, and City Club members only have this privilege. The first question will be asked by uh, Chris Smith, who's a member of the Board of Governors, and he chairs the Advocacy Committee. Chris is a lead internet technologist for the Xerox Office Group. Um, Mayor Katz will take a few questions uh, from each of the mics and she'll take them as she's seated. Chris? Mayor Katz, I confess I'm more than a little bit nostalgic today. Uh, my career as a citizen activist has paralleled your term in office. I joined City Club the year before you were elected, and it was only a few years later that I testified before you for the first time, uh, I think in support of a bicycle plan for Northwest Portland. Uh, since then, I've become a City Council regular, uh, and I think I speak for activists all over the city when I say how much affection and respect we have for you and appreciation for letting us do our thing. And now I'd like to ask for your political wisdom one last time. Uh, you said that voters sent messages in elections, uh, and I'd like to ask you to read the tea leaves and tell us what you think uh, this last mayoral election signifies about the need for campaign finance reform. Easy. Actually, this last election sent a couple of messages, but the one on campaign finance reform, I think it was very clear that the citizens are offended and do not want to see huge dollars spent on political campaigns, especially in the local level. On the national level, they understand the cost of television and the mailings and everything else that's affiliated with it, but local campaigns, because it's the important thing in the local campaigns is getting your arm and your hand through the screen door. 
when you're knocking at the doors. By the way, for those of you who ever want to run for office, it's not good enough to have the screen door closed. It's got to be open and the hand has to go through it. And if you can walk into the kitchen and into the living room, that's even better. And the message that was sent because of the contrast between how two candidates handled the situation clearly set the tone for the election. There is no question about that. The other piece that's a little bit more personal is that I think uh, that those running for office, and I hope I did that when I first ran, need to be positive about this city. It's a wonderful city. We've made mistakes. There's no question, criticize us for it. But be positive about the city and what you can do. Uh, and I think those two factors had a lot to do with, uh, with the outcome of the election. Is Jim Francisconi here? I wanted to, th is he here? I wanted to thank him also. It's not only I who's finishing terms of office. He's finishing eight years here in the Portland City Council. His love for the city is unquestionable. Uh, and I want to wish him much luck and much success as he pursues his next career. Ray, you promised me you weren't going to ask me a question. Well, it's kind of a question. Okay. <laughs> Ray Polanyi, a city club member. Mayor Katz, you talk very much about the future, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. The future is what we can do something about. Uh, one million people coming, or something like that. Yeah, I lost my page on that one. <laughs> so it got a little jumbled. But a million people in the next 25 years. No question. We're getting ready for the storm sewer with a big pipe. It seems to me that it's time we paid attention to Max, the Metropolitan Area Express, and begin seriously the big tube <laughs> under the Willamette, under the city at the east and west side, so that Max can really be the Metropolitan Area Express. What do you think? <laughs> Oh, is your ans my answer going to surprise all of you to his question? I thought Ray was crazy a couple of years ago when he battled with us on that. But the more I think about the growth of this region and the traffic congestion that we are seeing today and the fact that we may and may not be able to accommodate all of our changes on our routes right now, that the notion of a metro or the notion of the next generation of transportation needs to be considered today and not wait. Thank you. I'm Aubrey Russell, City Club member. Uh, you mentioned the importance of PGE rates to the economy, this region's economy. Um, it seems to me that the, the vast bulk of commercial and industrial users in the regional economy are opposed to the proposed acquisition of PGE by TPG. The decision, though, about this acquisition will be made in Salem, where we have a governor who's put jobs and, and, uh, and income growth at the very top of, of his uh, priority lists. Um, my Your question, question? My, yeah, my, 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 my question to you is, uh, do we have a friend in the governor? Does this region's economy have a friend in the governor? Have we been in communication with the governor? Is he able to, to exert any pressure over the decision? Um, what has been your uh, what has been your reaction from the governor and from other elected officials in Salem uh, who represent uh, the ratepayers in in this region? Uh, we primarily have worked with the mayors in the the regional communities. Uh, making sure that the mayors of this region, going all the way down to Salem, have participated with us in the principles that we outlined and in what we think would be the next steps. I have talked to the governor. Uh, he, he suggested a possible solution, and I'm not free to share any of that. He's going to have to do that. And I said, you know, we'd be very interested if you'd spend a little bit of time looking at that and coming back to us and that's what we're waiting for now. 
Hello, Mayor. Heather Komet, City Club member. You spoke about the importance of the creative class economy to the overall economy of Portland. I'm grateful to call many of the people who classify as the creative class my friends. And I'd like for you to comment, please, on the interaction between the ultimate success of the creative class here in Portland and the housing community of Portland and the role the city might be able to play in that interplay. Good, good question. Um, we started a central city uh, thought group uh, with the Bureau of Planning, and one whole afternoon was spent on the creative class and trying to find out what we can do to help. Now, remember, when I met with them several times and I asked them, what can we do? They said, stay out of our way. They really didn't want us involved, but their concerns are, of course, affordable housing and workspaces. Uh, not only for the younger young and restless, but the older ones that are beginning to start a family uh, and that c can't sleep on the floor of a studio, may want a kitchen and a separate bathroom. Uh, and we've been exploring what it is we can... People I know. Yeah. <laughs> we've been exploring what we can do and how we can tie it in with our, all of our affordable housing goals. And as I said, unless we find funding solutions or set different priorities, we're not going to be able to, to meet them. The other issue that you didn't mention is that we need to tie the business community with these young people. Uh, it's very, they don't belong to the city club, they don't belong to the Mac club. It is very difficult for them to make those initial contacts so they can talk about what they're doing uh, and maybe ask the key questions about how they can help the businesses themselves. And so we've been thinking about identifying some of these businesses that are s small, entrepreneurial, and linking them to many of these creative young people that we've also begun to identify. By the way, this is a ve you need to study this. This is a very interesting phenomenon that's, a, that's happening not only in Portland, but in other cities like Seattle and Austin and Boston. Uh, but we are at the top of the list because they find this city a very open and friendly place uh, and they enjoy it. Yes. Uh, you're a um, Kurt Wavering member. Um, in addition to being friendly and interesting, the city is also beautiful. And in 1971, the City Club did a study on billboards. In your administration, you picked up on a second study we did to deal with that and also the very difficult issue of wall murals. Um, my question goes beyond that as to what do you see needs to be done to preserve and enhance the visual quality of the city as we develop and have more people in development occur? Say no to Clear Channel. <laughs> over and over and over again. Mark my word. I'm at the door, their foot will be in the door. Mark my word. And Kurt, thank you for your work representing the City Club on the mural issue. We solved, well, I, th I think we solved the mural issue uh, by thinking creatively, uh, but because of the quirkiness of our own state constitution, we have a lot of things that we had overcome. But the City Council will have to say no thank you. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Thank you, Mayor Katz. Um, my question is um, drawn from realizing that the boundaries between our city and the greater metro region, the, the state of Oregon, and the national and international um, realms are more permeable than ever. What can we as citizens of Oregon do to promote living wages affordable and safe and sustainable communities and access to health care for all. Do you want me to really answer that question? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to answer it a, a little broadly than that. The living wage issue and poverty in the economy really underlines all of the socioeconomic issues that you just identified, including health care which has not been resolved by anybody. And until 
that issue is dealt with on the national level. There is relatively little that we can do other than be on the next wave of the next economy, which is the reason that I focused in, not only on manufacturing jobs, but on the creative economy. And to innovate, to innovate, to innovate, so that our services and our products are ahead of everybody else. That will create family wage jobs. But in addition to that, the national economy needs to deal with the fact that we are in a huge deficit situation and that providing tax cuts that they think will in fact stimulate the economy will have a detrimental effect in, in, in paying for the services. And I'm back to the services uh, that make families families uh, and opportunities and especially containing the health care costs or changing the entire health care system. Thank you so okay. much. One more question. One more. Uh, Marcus Samantel, City Club member. Uh, you talked a little bit about Measure 37, and yesterday I had the privilege of chatting with Hector McPherson, uh, and of course you might expect he's a little concerned about what's going on. His question to me was, and I ask this of you, uh, what big idea and who should take it uh, to Salem to try and do something to make 37 work since it passed 60-40? Well, here, here's the dilemma. If I was the supporters of Ballot Measure 37, I wouldn't do anything that would frighten the legislators. I would wait until they've gone home. I mean, this is, uh, if they're not that smart and they in fact want to t take their claim uh, to the local city councils or counties, uh, we will have a database and a history to bring to the legislature and to show them what the impact of 37 is going to be. They won't repeal it, but they will need to try to find some solutions. Now, if I recall correctly, either during the last legislative session or during the interim, there were legislators that were trying to preempt ballot measure 37, and it, it, they failed. And we may, they may want to open up that conversation again during this legislative session. But if we don't have cases where really bad things can happen, the legislature might just take a back seat and wait. But the leadership is gonna to need to come from the governor. We don't have the funds, so the, the issue is, you know, is school funding the top priority or is ballot measure 37 the top priority? How do we find new funds? There's been talk about the real estate tr finally getting support uh, and passing a real estate transfer tax that can be used not only to fund ballot measure 37, but also for affordable housing. If we can get through that, that would be a big win. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can all say thank you for 32 years of service. Thank you for 32 years of service, Mayor Katz. We are adjourned.